<laughs> well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Webinar Talk Show. My name is Tom Singer. And I'm Eliz Green. And as you know, our theme for this season is don't cancel your event. We have such a fun guest who is coming to us from <laughs> vacation, which is even more fun. <laughs> we love it when people just show what's possible in a virtual environment because it wouldn't be possible to talk for us to talk to her when she's in Mexico if we were planning an in-person event. <laughs> That's right. And what's really cool is our theme for this entire season has been don't cancel your event. And even though Sarah and her husband decided to extend their time in Mexico because it was really safe, lower COVID than is at home, she said, we're not canceling the webinar talk show. We can do this thing because we live in this virtual world. So today's guest is Sarah Michelle. She works for a company called Velvet Chainsaw Consulting. And what they do is they are a conference improvement firm and they work with associations to really help them make their events better, have better attendee engagement. Mm -hmm. And Sarah specializes in that along with making the networking really pop and be awesome, whether that's a virtual event, a hybrid event, or an in-person conference. So welcome to the webinar talk show, Sarah Michelle. Yay! Hola, hola. <laughs> we are so glad that you were able to join us today. And I think we should just jump right in and get to the meat of this conversation, which is really about, since you work for a consulting firm who works with some of the largest associations in the world, what are you seeing your clients do right now in these crazy times? Hmm. Well, obviously, um, most of them, I would say 90% of our uh, association clients have gone to virtual. They've mm -hmm. done a virtual annual. Um, and I think for, uh, I think all of them, if they were here would tell you, although it was a ton of work, mm -hmm. uh, painstakingly ton of work. Um, I think all of them would probably sit here and tell you they can't wait to go back on site and they will never, ever, ever complain about <laughs> about their feet hurting in or uh, what the, you know, the exhaustion of being on site because uh, pulling off a virtual event is not for the faint hearted. Mm -hmm. It is um, a lot of work, but they have all been surprised and blown away by first of all, the amount in, of engagement. Uh, everybody's seen higher numbers. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody has seen, um, if typically if you're, uh, you know, we're only working primarily with, you know, national global associations and they've seen a huge uptick in global participation that normally would never make it to the annual meeting in the States. Sure. Uh, they've seen, um, different, different segments of their association that are normally very quiet have been, um, showing up for these virtual events. So they're getting, um, they're also getting a lot of, uh, we're also seeing a lot of non-members. Um, joining oh. virtual events and that, and that that has some and that has been converting to membership because people have come in as a non-member so that's been kind of a, a, a big surprise and, um, and and then I think just sheer that the um, the amount of numbers and people just so appreciative that they didn't cancel mm -hmm. so appreciative that they did something and for many for many of our clients you know, their annual meeting of what they offer that profession is it, that that's it. And if they had canceled, you know, these people would have had nothing when it comes to CEUs or education. So they're so appreciative that it wasn't canceled and that um, they're still getting the education and connection that they're starving for. Those CEUs are really important in for associations where that's the key component to their annual event is making sure that that education happens and license stay current and all of that. But Tom said at the beginning that the attendee engagement part is really important. And I think the clients that I've talked to are very concerned about, yeah, they can do the education part, but how do they really serve that community part? We come for the education, yeah. but but the reason that we really love it is that we get to be with the people. How are you yeah. helping your clients do that in a in a big way? 
Yeah, and I would actually say, Liz, that um, CEUs are becoming a little bit of a commodity because you can get mm. CEUs uh, anywhere right now. Um, and for many professions, it's actually available free or cheap. So I don't even think that's a driver anymore for um, it. I mean, I, it's a cherry on top. You know, if I'm going to attend and I'm going to get some CEUs, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And that might be just another reason why I might register. But it's not going to be the driver anymore because CEU is available everywhere. What, as you said, you might show up for the education, but what's going to get you to stay online for those two, three days is going to be the engagement and the community. Number one thing, I think meaningful relationships, meaningful connections is what people are starving for. And so, yeah, you might log on for that one session, but the only reason you're going to stay or come back the next day is if during um, a, uh, a session you had this really meaningful chat going on and the chat was so robust and there were so many great resources and things shared that you downloaded the chat, you um, copied hmm. the chat, the pictures of the chat, mm -hmm. you ended up, you know, um, you were on a, a portal or on a, um, uh, you know, a platform that had an ability for you to reach out to somebody uh, instantly and make a connection or even have a conversation or go to, you know, lots of cool um, bells and whistles are available now where you can actually ping the person and get on almost like FaceTime with them. Or you, uh, you know, you went into a, a Zoom chat room and you got into a virtual breakout and you were in that breakout room with six other people and for 45 50 minutes you shared you cried you laughed mm -hmm. uh, those are the reasons why their people rave and why they come back and why they show up for the entire three days so it's so, those kinds of strat strategies and you know i i um i'm sure like you two when we've been, you know, we've obviously been pushing people need to have a virtual strategy for a long time. And most of our clients were like, yeah, we'll get to that, you know, someday kind of thing. And now here's the someday. But I, when we first, you know, our very first one rolled out, I think early May, late April, early, no, late April was our first client that literally had to pivot to virtual. They were supposed to be live in person at the end of April. We had worked with them for a year on redesigning their annual meeting. They were so excited. They had blown their, their registration numbers were off the charts. They had sold out. It was just, and then here they were, and they pivoted to virtual and, and then picked up even more people, which was crazy. But I, um, I, I came into that. I, I was very um, not optimistic. I thought mm -hmm. there's this was a, this was an association that really needed. It, they were on, they were on suicide prevention. That's their mission, oh. and it was like, you know, how how can we do this virtually? I don't understand how this is going to work, and people need to be able to talk. And I came away from that experience like, oh my gosh, this can be very meaningful, like unbelievable meaningful. And then taking the lessons from that from the end of April. And it's just like every single time we pull one of these off, it's like, I, I can't yeah. believe it. I can't believe that there can be this much connection. People can feel so um, part of their community in a virtual world. So, Sarah, that brings up the question is how do you get the networking and the engagement to actually happen? I've been on dozens of events and some mm -hmm. of them are like, wow, I can't believe how great that was. I met these people. I have a follow up. I felt like I got value from the human to human connection. And I've been on other events where maybe it was the way the planners prioritize it, but it was all about the education and the rest of it was just a flop. How do you make yeah. sure that you have that engagement and that networking value? Well, I mean, it, it, a lot of it starts with the platform that you choose. So um, that's that's like the first step is is making sure you're on some platform that's going to support um, the ability to have chat, the ability to do Q and A, the ability to um, uh, leverage things like either access into a Zoom room or the platform mm -hmm. that, you know, that has that ability for virtual breakouts. Um, so it, you've got to pick a platform that that will support engagement where engagement is you know is is part of the design and so as we we work with some of our clients as, as they're actually selecting and we're in on a lot of demos and that's the first question i'm asking is what is your strategy for engagement and show me exactly how you leverage that and if it comes across like an afterthought um <laughs> i'm not interested in that platform yeah. 
So it's it's really that. And then I, I, a lot of it too, as you guys know, it's like training speakers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's funny, almost every basic um, platform is gonna have the ability for things like chat or possibly doing polling or things like that. And it's, but, it, but if the speaker doesn't know how to leverage that or have an engagement right. plan, it doesn't matter how pretty your platform is, they're not gonna leverage it. So a lot of what we do, I do personally on the team is, is work with training the non-professional speakers who are delivering 90% of the association virtual program, if not 95%, and they're not professionals and they've not presented virtually. And yet this is how our virtual event is gonna be riding on whether or not these sessions are engaging. And so there, there needs to be investment into, into coaching, preparing and training speakers to provide engaging virtual programs. We talk about that as the production call <laughs> because we yeah. like to, we like to look at what we do as really treating it as a talk show or a variety show. So there has to be a production call because otherwise, how do you know what you're going to do? And right. that seems to create so much more comfort for those non-professional speakers. We still do it if they're professional speakers as well. Yeah. <laughs> you should. Uh, yeah. But really looking at does it need to be you know, you're you're in this little window next to your PowerPoint sort of presentation, or could we mix that up and do something different, do an interview or do, you know, a little recording and then uh, sort of dissect that or whatever. It, not making everything the same in terms of your content yeah. really helps with that, you know, Zoom fatigue or, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. How are you working with MCs or hosts or that sort of thing to create that for your clients? Uh, we we don't even think the MC thing is a nice to have. We think it's a have to have. Um, it, 100% you have to have it. And it's, um, I've been doing, I've been serving in that role for quite mm -hmm. a few of our clients, but, um, but it, it, it's just, it's imperative that you have somebody who, I mean, I think when we're in person, uh, it's a nice to have, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and several people can sometimes in the association can play that role, but in a virtual setting, it's, it's imperative that you have somebody who really understands who's good in front of camera, who's, who's good at virtual, you know, virtual delivery, and then really understands how to thread the experience and, right. and has production sense, like you said, Eliz, you know, really gets production because in a virtual world, um, in a virtual uh, conference situation, you got to think like a TV producer. Right. Yep. You don't you don't think like a conference, you know, um, a professional meeting planner. You got to think like a like a producer. And so, like you said, you know, how can you look at the run a show and say, wow, this is way too much PowerPoint or wow, this is way too much talking head. How can we mix this up? You know, boy, this this particular uh, executive is not really great or comfortable in front of camera. What if we interview them right. or what if we do around, you know, so it's that kind of coming to it with a production mentality. And so I often, you know, working with an experienced MC who's really good virtually can, can bring in those uh, production elements and ideas for, for energy shift and flow that I have found. I mean, the planners I work with are just so, thrilled and happy and relieved because there's so much going on for them and they're not oh, producers i mean they don't know how to do this and so they're they're like they're loving okay. this partnership of having somebody who gets it um to really be a partner with them so it's um you know in the in, a, in the virtual mc work that i've done and I, and I know tom has done a lot of this too is is you know i'm working with them months in advance Mm -hmm. um, more, so, mm -hmm. more so than had I, if I was going to be their MC in person, because there's so much of, like you said, really looking at that flow and energy and edit and almost coming at it with an editor mentality. Like that's going to be too long that let's, okay. let's, sh let's shorten that piece. Let's do this. Let's bring in some music. I mean, now what we're, what I'm seeing more now than I saw maybe like May, June, now it's kind of become a thing is that we need more entertainment elements. So what's happened is people have been staring at their screens since March 
And we are aesthetically, I mean, we just are so burned out on it. And in order to keep people engaged, there, you know, we're, we're having to add a lot more. I just got done with a big three day meeting before I came down here, uh, you know, 12,000 attendees, National Association. And we did much more, we meaningfully plugged in like musical and we had, a, you know, DJs mm -hmm. and we had a sand artist and we had a Zen and we had illusionists and all these entertainment elements that were just dropped in strategically throughout the day to break up the monotony. And that, that's something we were never talking about in March, April, May. Oh yeah. And now it's like something that everybody's having to kind of look at. Well, and one of the things you were talking about, about the master of ceremonies role being a must have for mm -hmm. this virtual environment. Obviously this is something that like you, Eliz and I, you know, this is what we do and it's what we've done. We actually have a, a client that we're working with that we suggested if anybody who isn't a professional is a little nervous about presenting digitally because yeah, a lot of business professionals have gotten on stage and spoken in front of groups, but this might still be one of the first times yeah. they're ever yeah. getting in front of a camera. If they would like to do an interview format, you know, we could do this, what we're doing with you right now. And what's interesting is two of the speakers said, yes, that would be the yeah. great way for me to get my information across. And yeah. it chops up the day. So it's not just, mm -hmm. as we said, talking head over PowerPoint, followed by talking head over PowerPoint. So how do you get the clients and the speakers they're working with to be open-minded to making some of these changes, whether it's an interview format or if it's, hey, we're going to shorten you to 20 minutes, not an hour? You know, I think it start. Um, uh, our our approach has been whoever the you know really the organizer is, whoever is the owner of the meeting. Sometimes that's you know the VP over conventions and meetings, or it, it might be the education person, or it's a combination of both. And it starts off with that kind of strategy conversation. You know, what's the strategy of this event? You know, what are we trying? What's the purpose? You know, who's the audience? Who are we designing this for? And we kind of get you know, a lot of those things kind of figured out the strategy of it. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's the, once we know who, right, what's the why, what's the why behind this session? So if it's, um, you know, if we're not worrying about CEUs, which a lot of, a lot of times in this virtual world, we're kind of saying, you know, we're not going to worry about the CEU. It's around, is it around bringing the profession together in, in a unity? Is it around, um, you know, the having more of a relevant conversation around the world that we're in. I mean, we one thing we've really realized is if if a session could have been delivered in January of, of this year, mm -hmm. it has no business in a virtual uh, conference right now. Zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it, the content has to be right now for people very relevant. What you delivered in January should not be delivered now. It has to come with a lens of of the world we're in and the upheaval that we're in and the complete disruption that we're in because if it could have been delivered in january i'm going to tune out i'm going to i'm, I'm going to just i'm going to click off i'm not going to listen if you're not speaking relevancy so relevancy is king over context is king over content so what we have found is once we've got the strategy of who we're designing for um that the the purpose of um of the 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 goal of the session right and then if it's around bringing this really relevant content and maybe interviewing an expert or something you know it starts with a conversation of me just saying you know what if they were interviewed and we could really pull out a really experienced interview can really pull out this content and we know that people are looking much more at heads. If you go to a slide and a tiny little box, you know, mm -hmm. again, people can tune out. And again, you know, you want that um, fear of missing out. So if a session is just a talking head with PowerPoint, it's probably going to be recorded and go on demand. And then I have no reason to tune in right now because I can watch nice. this at, you know, at mm -hmm. two in the morning if I wake up in the middle of the night and can't go back to bed. I need a reason to be clicked on live when when we have this conference and on and, and the clicking on is if there's an opportunity for me to ask a question. There's an opportunity for me to um, respond in something in chat. And um, and so that kind of interview format. And so I, it's really, um, Tom, I, I, I don't, it really just comes down to, I have found just making those suggestions um, 
you know, giving them some facts around how people, you know, why people will attend or not attend or why they'll zone out or zone in and what would get somebody to, to pay attention. I mean, really mm -hmm. basic brain science. Of, of what people pay attention to, that people have been really open to that. And like you guys said, a lot of times when um, it might be like the the planner, the you know, the whoever the meeting owner is, and I get on a phone call with this person, this expert, and it's suggesting, well, what do you think about this? What if we interviewed you? Or what if, and they're like, like you said, <laughs> most of the time, like, that's great. Um, but But I think it's really up to the meeting owner to say um, the 60 minute session is not gonna happen. Right. You're not gonna have 60 minutes. That's that's a misuse of the design of this of this program that's not appropriate. The session is now 40 minutes or the session is now 35 minutes. And typically when the person says, and I work, we work with a lot of scientific, a lot of medical, I mean, they're like, well, I mm. could possibly do my thousand slides <laughs> in 35 minutes. You know, we say, <laughs> yup, you're right, you can't. Yeah. So you won't. That's <laughs> yeah. not how we're going to do it. Um, but here's how we are going to do it. And and most of the most of the time, uh, and and sometimes you you do have people that say, "I'm sorry, I can't work with that." And we go, "You're probably right. Let's mm -hmm. let's let's wait. Let's wait and use you next year, or let's mm -hmm. wait and use you for uh, you know regional meeting, or when we go hybrid." Um, but when we go hybrid, by the way, that's a whole nother beast. Because uh, yes. you know, uh, speaking in a hybrid world is not for the for the wussies. I mean, this is you think speaking virtually is hard. We have, to, we have two audiences at the same time. So, I mean, that's going to require a whole lot of uh, training and support um, mm -hmm. to speak to two audiences at the same time. And I, I think that we'll be seeing, we already have some folks going hybrid that, you know, the, the in-person studio audience mm -hmm. is going to be fraction of what the right. virtual audience will be um and how do you connect those worlds how do you uh you know serve both those needs that are very different needs well and that's where tom and i really cut our teeth in this whole thing is being that bridge between a live audience and a virtual audience and you're right it isn't it isn't just setting up a camera <laughs> and saying oh we're just gonna you know broadcast what's in person <laughs> No, that's not exactly what happened. I mean, it's a little bit of what happens, but it's not the whole thing. And I am imagining that the platforms for that interaction are going to be a very important component of a successful hybrid because you have to have all of those pieces that you have in a virtual environment for the hybrid as well. Right. Yeah, and then you know, really, the the role of um, the MC is is even more critical. And you really have to have almost kind of two, mm -hmm. like yep. you guys are a great combination, because one person needs to be the eyes and ears for the virtual audience, yep. and and serving them in the room, as well as somebody kind of working with the live audience. Um, and I mean, you can certainly have somebody doing both, but it's hard. It's hard enough just to do the one. <laughs> well, well, yeah, well, well, there's also a delay. Right. So, you know, you're talking to live audience and it could be 10, 15 second delay with the virtual. So it's, um, you know, when I've had to do it alone, I, I, it's really important to put the, to have a lot of interaction. So you're putting the live audience into an exercise and you're, you're stepping down and walking over to your virtual moderator and saying, what questions is it, you know, or you might give them a different direction, but it is walking, chewing gum, scratching your head, your be your belly, riding a bicycle. <laughs> bicycle. It is, and, it is and what, is what, what Eliz and I discovered when we started doing the hybrid broadcast six years ago was that you know when most people were just broadcasting their main stage, and then when they'd go to coffee breaks, they would just throw up a slide that says "back in a half hour," and they would lose a lot right. of their audience. Mm -hmm. So right. that's where we came in and started this whole idea of interviews and treating it like a talk show. Because six years ago, we realized that people don't turn on their TVs to watch a lecture. They turn on their TVs, though, since the 1950s to watch a variety show or a talk show. And mm -hmm. so we early on started structuring a lot of what we did along that ways. But when you bring up hybrid, now you've got two shows. You've got mm -hmm. your show for the people in the room. And you've got your TV TV audience, so it becomes yeah. a lot more like like maybe an NFL game or or a Major League Baseball game, where you're programming for the stadium, 
and you're programming for the TV audience. Yep. And I promise you that in those settings, those are entirely different teams, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Absolutely right. So um, yeah, and you know, and I think that I, I really, I bet a year from right now, we won't even be using the word hybrid. We're just gonna say, this is how we do meetings. Yes. I agree, because who's going to go back to only serving this many people when you can serve really almost your entire association? Yeah, everyone's going to have to have a virtual strategy with their in-person, and it, it will be, it will just be the way we do meetings. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is going to, um, I suspect you two will be very busy, because this will Let's be- Let's hope uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, you know, having having people that know how to thread that, how to how to blend those two worlds, how, because there's going to be times when those worlds need to come together and when they mm -hmm. need to be treated separately and they're going to have different needs. And it really does require um, two two different strategies. And it's um, you're almost running two different meetings mm -hmm. at the same time. It's kind of what's yes. happening. And, but, um, and, and I think that that's going to be the hardest part for a lot of planners. So what advice do you have as we go back, be it six months or 10 months from now, as we go back to that live event with most likely a hybrid component, what advice do you have for people that they need to start thinking about today for both audiences? Mm. Well, I think, um, you know, really, we have one client, a really big one that, um, pulled off their annual virtual, they canceled and pulled off their annual virtual, the only three months notice. And uh, they, it, it, it was still, it was amazingly successful with what they had to deal, what has a little bit of time they had to deal with and what they did. And what they decided is, even though they're August of 21, um, they are planning to go virtual again in August 21 and really nail that. I mean, just get really good. They're already really good at in-person. Now they want to get really good at virtual. And then in 22, um, be able to do a very, very good hybrid. Um, so I think really understanding virtual and, and, and being able to pull that off well will serve you going into hybrid. If you've mm -hmm. never done or, or you know, if you, if you canceled your annual this year because you didn't want to do a virtual, I, I have very big concerns for you thinking you can pull off a hybrid <laughs> this this coming year if you if you canceled your face to face and didn't do a virtual i think you really mm -hmm. have to understand um virtual production and and what that means and and by the way production you know we talked about platform production wins the day over platform any day mm -hmm. of the week um you can have a mm -hmm. fabulous conference using something as cheap as zoom um if you have good production so it's it's uh it really understanding that I think is going to serve the planner well to know that they have that under on their in their under their belts they produced a virtual, and then um, as the going into hybrid realizing your virtual audience is probably going to be bigger. I mean it will be it will be easily the end of twenty one before most people are vaccinated, and and feel safe to travel and can afford to travel because we're still going right. to have a lot of economic fallout from this and travel budgets are going to be frozen and things like that. So um, your audience will be larger. So really knowing how to do that and, um, and, and, and then, you know, look and figuring out. So if you have that virtual experience, then I think you can begin to do that. It will be costly. Hybrid is not going to be cheap. Um, mm. It will, you know, my suggestion to planners is you start out small. I mean, you're not going to have, you're not, broadcasting from every room you're probably picking right. your your general session room will be you know always always uh streamed and then maybe one other room that mm -hmm. you very selectively put whatever concurrent sessions are going to be the biggest draw or um ha you know have the most interest or whatever whatever you decide to do that and you put those rooms in there and then you're going to have to do things like what you guys um, do, which is those in-betweens, you know, how right. do you bridge those two worlds? Um, but people thinking that they're streaming every session, there's no way you can afford that. It is, <laughs> it is wildly expensive, um, you know, to do. So, so it really starting off small and being, you know, very strategic, um, 
but I, I the best advice I have for a planner right now is figure out how to do virtual get you know uh, even if your association canceled and you didn't do it go help a colleague oh, um, you know good advice. Go, go, go shadow ask a colleague if you can sit in and you know and 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 be uh, somehow on the inside of it so that you can see the inner workings because I think that's the best way to serve you going into hybrid. Yep. That's very smart. Sarah, if someone's watching this and they're like, who is this Sarah Michelle person and what is Velvet Chainsaw? How do I find her to get more? How do people contact you? Um, velvetchainsaw.com, um, just like it sounds, is our website. And uh, you can find me through the website very easily. Just go to our team and um, click on that. Uh, we do have a, a really great, robust blog. A lot of people follow, mm -hmm. um, and we don't sell anything. We have nothing, you know. We don't have any any tchotchkes. There's nothing to sell. <laughs> so uh, we, there's not even a, like all we. I think you can get our blog by just giving us your email. That's it, mm -hmm. and um, there's nothing to sell. But but anyways, the um, that we've got a lot of good stuff there. A lot of good white papers, good research. Um, we do have a newsletter. So yeah, velvetchainsaw.com. Everybody should go to velvetchainsaw.com. You really should. <laughs> it's, it, it is a wonderful resource. So thank you, uh, Sarah. Tom, we have an exciting week coming up next week. Tomorrow, uh, this week, just this Monday episode, because on Wednesday, we are emceeing, two, Wednesday and Thursday, we're yes. emceeing the SpinCon uh, event, which is, if you haven't registered for, it is open to any meetings industry professionals and their grandmas, I believe. If you're, <laughs> if you're in the meetings business, you should be virtually attending SpinCon this year because it's going to be should. awesome. I happen, and Eliz, we've happened to have had a chance to see and talk to all the speakers so we know what you're in store for. Don't miss SpinCon. You can find them at spinplanners.com. Next week, Monday and Wednesday, we have great episodes to close out our second season. We have Angelique Rubers joining us on Monday to talk about the trends in corporate events. And then on Wednesday, we have Kristen Arnold and Sherry Banks to talk about how they pivoted the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers annual conference into the virtual world. Excited to hear about that. Please join us. Tom, if they want to find us, where would they find us? You can find us at webinartalkshow.com. You can also follow us on Facebook uh, because we have, that's where all of these episodes are broadcast live and we have lots of other information there. And that's just the webinar talk show Facebook page. Yep. And you can find it at webinartalkshow.live if you want to go there easily. Dot live. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us and sharing all your wisdom about events always our favorite person about Aww. trends in the meeting industry. We really appreciate you being with Thanks us. And you guys. And, and uh, making Kristen, time in Mexico for us. Thank you. Absolutely. And I want to big, give a big shout out to Kristen Arnold coming up. Don't miss that oh, session. Yeah. She's yeah, a good friend of mine. Friend. And she, they pulled off a fabulous event with some really, and Kristen's going to share some really cool formats. Mm. Um, and things that she did that I haven't seen a lot of people do. So tune in for that. Nice. Excellent. Nice. We'll be back All right, next everybody. week. We'll be back next week. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye.